All right, I'm hitting that button. Kaplow! Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. I apologize profusely for not streaming last week, but, uh, I, I mean, I had the class all ready to go, but, uh, it was... The thermostat said it was 98, and I feel like it might have been more like 105 in my room. <laughs> um... So yeah, I, I was going to power through it, but uh, I'm glad I did not, because it was very hot. But now I have a new AC, and it only cost $11,000. Ah! But uh, thank gosh I make that cybersecurity money. Um, yes, congrats to our friend Amy, who has passed her GSEC, which is amazing. She's part of the SANS Women Training Academy, I think, where you get three certs paid for, which is awesome because SANS certs are amazing and uh, the trainings are like uh, seven or eight thousand dollars on their own. Um, if you're interested, you should check out, I, I think, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they, they look for applications at the beginning of the year. But uh, regardless, that's a super great opportunity she's taken advantage of. And uh, if you can, too, then you should. So I am going to get started. I am super excited about this topic. It's kind of timely with um, <laughs> something that uh, w with what's going on in the world and uh, just in general. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to hop into a presentación. All right. Oh, whoops. Sneak peek. All right. So, as usual, just reminding y'all that I am just your facilitator friend. Um, I think most learning actually happens in between your ears, uh, or much te most teaching happens in between your ears, because you're going to teach yourself. I'm just sort of throwing things at you, and I uh, hope you take these things and run with them, um, because, you know, it's not... It's not going to be just my class that gets you a job. It's going to be you sort of connecting the dots. But uh, I am more than happy to share some of the dots I've found along the way. So this one is on critical thinking on attack and defense. I was having trouble trying to phrase the title, but uh, mainly just we've talked about critical thinking or problem solving before and how our, how our brains are so powerfully equipped to problem solve. That is literally the thing that separates us from most of the things on this planet is our powerful uh, planning uh, capabilities and critical thinking and problem solving capabilities. So uh, we're going to go over a little bit on the nature of critical thinking and uh, what that means, maybe some questions we ask that uh, sort of provoke those kinds of thoughts. And then we're going to think about how attackers critically think and how defenders critically think and like the problems they need to solve for the position they're in. So, um, critical thinking, uh, is, I, I wrote in the subtitle there is, is like thinking in layers. And in the first episode, we talked about turtles all the way down where the great thing about all of these turtles is that you can learn about any of them, and all of this will be interrelated. So as you sort of ask more questions and find more answers to your to your own uh, model of figuring out what turtles lay on top of which and how they interact with each other, uh, that's just going to serve you more and more as you build more and more models about computers, which are but just a bunch of models that uh, do a bunch of calculations really quickly for us. So I wanted to distinguish between critical thinking and another type of problem solving. I couldn't find an exact word for the difference, um, like in education, if, if there is a word in the pedagogy of like what the difference in teaching styles is, but um, I called it pattern matching versus critical thinking. Um, and what I mean by pattern matching is I think that a lot of uh, traditional education is super focused either if it's if it's word problems and like history, uh, English, that sort of thing, it's who, what, when, where, maybe surface level how and why, um, or it's like in arithmetic, I think is the most clear example, you sort of get taught formulas. You get a pattern, like here's how you add stuff. 
So you start with two plus two. You, great, you got four. Then you start adding a few more, you know, numbers or digits on the end of that. And now you're adding 10 plus 16 and then 23,000 plus 36,262. But regardless, you're still following the same pattern. You're just kind of plugging things into a model that's built already. You're not making your own model. So to me, that that becomes uh, boring really quickly, I think, for most people, because it's kind of uh, just regurgitation and repetition. And repetition is good. We talked about, you know, how that helps things stay in your brain. But um, I can imagine a lot of us don't have much memory of what's in our brain uh, that we learned in school. And we were supposedly learned a lot. I mean, we were schooled for 12 years in the American education system. And there's a lot I don't remember. Um, and I think the difference between critical thinking is asking questions and problem solving. So when I get into whys and hows, there's so much more depth in those questions that kind of just is not integrated into uh, traditional education in a lot of ways. I've had some great, excellent, amazing teachers, and I feel like they were inserting the how and the why and giving me that uh, sort of like perspective. So then the who, what's, when's, and where's become a lot more interesting when I'm understanding the nuance of the things around it. Like, I didn't think I liked uh, history really at all. I was like, this is pointless. But then I had a high school teacher, Mr. Bingham, who was just so excited about history. Like we would be, you know, reading the paragraphs in the book in class and just like, oh, well, you know, and someone starts reading it. And then he jumps, they finish the paragraph, and then he's like, whoa, could you imagine? Germany's like this, and, you know, they've got this going on and this going on, but then they think this. And then, he, like, the way he phrased it and added, like, a contextual character to what's going on in the text, of which could have just been, you know, you know, in 1776, they got together and didn't want the king around anymore. But like tying it to sort of the nuance of what was happening in those people's lives gave it so like so much more vitality in the source material. And I think really good teachers are able to figure out ways to get that across to their students. Um, so yeah, uh, that's what I sort of wanted to focus on um, when I say critical thinking. Um, I want to go quickly, I, I say quickly, uh, because there's a lot here and I rambled when I did my practice, when I did my practice version of this. So this is at criticalthinking.org. It has this critical thinking model, little like uh, circular uh, doodad. I think it's really cool because it offers a lot of questions for each one of these concepts in critical thinking. And let's just briefly go over them. I'm going to try to be brief, but uh, we'll see. <sighs> Uh, so it has these standards that you might, you might want to align your, your thoughts to, uh, when you're performing something or explaining something and, and how to critically think about something. I think that the more juicy bits is these eight elements of the circle here. So just to sort of preface this with, uh, just world events, like, I think it's, timely that, uh, you know, the world is, is having a bit of a, bit of a uprising at the moment. And, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of the status quo is being questioned and, uh, you know, the status quo has some great things about it. There are some, also some very terrible, terrible things built into the status quo. And, uh, the status quo really relies on people not critically thinking. Uh, it, I mean, you, you've got Democrats and Republicans. Both of, both of them are ultimately pushing an agenda of a system. And that does, that system is not in threat by either one of those parties. It's, uh, that money goes to different places depending on who, who, uh, takes the reins. But, uh, if we critically think a few levels up, we're ultimately serving the same system. Not much is going to change. It's just going to be two, two groups of people arguing about stuff. So I think it's interesting to think about uh, sort of media and how uh, messages are presented in a way often that are factual or sound intuitively logical, uh, but 
if you dismantle them with some of these critical thinking questions, you would notice a lot of holes in the theories or the axioms or assumptions that are holding up those viewpoints. Um, so it doesn't matter what side you're on, everyone does this. And uh, I mean, we all do this every day of our lives, but I think the more we get used to doing critical thinking, it's going to be one of the most valuable skill sets you can have in security um, because of how many variables are tossed in at once. There's no pattern. Like, you could say the pattern is look at the alert and then figure it out. <laughs> but the, the, the steps are difficult to quantify because the alerts you get can uh, have pieces in so many different systems that it's going to take critical thinking to, well, I think because it's on 443, oh, it's SSL. So what is that? What does that mean when I'm thinking about what I'm trying to solve here? And is this alert apply to SSL or should it have fired on plain text traffic? And this is encrypted randomness. And so it really isn't firing on anything at all, which is, it's a very common, this is very common in, in security operation centers. Uh, so just all that to say, here are some interesting things to think about when we're digesting information, the point of view. Uh, it's the place from which you view something it includes what you are looking at and the way you are seeing it and it, and everyone's point of view has limitations. Uh, so it can be worth it to consider other relevant viewpoints. I would really recommend going through these questions on your own. This is a super cool chart. I would take some notes and, uh, maybe look at an article and go ahead and dig in on it or, or a YouTube video or, or just listen to something and, uh, dig at it with some of these questions. Um, the purpose, what is the goal of what you're trying to, to write or inform about, or what is the purpose of the thing you're reading? Does it have a goal or objective? What might that be? Um, and when you write, you should be clear about what your purpose is and that purpose should be justifiable. Uh, you got to think about the question. What, what is the, uh, what is the hypothesis and, uh, you know, the, the answer in a, in a scientific experiment or a critical thinking experiment may not be your hypothesis. You might have to change your, your question as you go. And, uh, yeah, topic is InfoSec, but this applies to everything. And that's, that's why I'm sort of trying to tie things in here. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, this is a skill that you can use in everyday life all the time. And the more you use it, uh, when you come to, uh, be looking for an InfoSec job, this is the skill set that is very difficult to teach. If we interview someone and they've kind of been a paint by numbers person to get their computer science degree, it's really obvious within five to 10 minutes of the interview that, uh, you know, if we say, how do you find the bad guy? And they're like, well, you should run antivirus. And it's like, oh no, there's so, there's so much more. There's so many questions we could ask. There's so many answers that we don't have. Um, so, yeah, using, using this in everyday life is, is going to own your skills. And you, you already do this in so many different spheres. It's just applying it to more things. Uh, so thinking about the question, uh, when we don't have a good question, our thinking will lack clarity and distinctness. Um, it reminds me of the Douglas Adams uh, answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. But that means what is the ultimate question? And now the computer, the ultimate computer that solved for the ultimate answer has to work for, you know, 15 billion years to figure that out. Um, because the question is often the harder thing to formulate than the answer. Um, and then we're looking at information, facts, data, evidence, or experiences that we use to figure things out does not imply accuracy or correctness. I think that's really important. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think when you're reading an infosec article, or, or something meant to inform you very rarely is there an agenda beyond your own education. But, uh, if, uh, U S history books are any indication, uh, with native American genocide, then, uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, the, the omission of information can be information about the speaker, uh, interpretation and inference. Uh, these are conclusions you come to or inferring is what the mind does in figuring something out. So this is, this is where a lot of those jumps come. We're like, 
appealing to something that sounds true and then making inferences upon that, that maybe necessarily that the thing that sounded true is not true in the context they're saying it. Uh, yeah, is my inference logical? Are there are other conclusions I should consider. M most of the time, these aren't being considered by, by news outlets that are uh, selling a narrative. Uh, then we're digging into some of the concepts informing these ideas that we're talking about and these words that are coming up that we're reading. Uh, yeah, theories, laws, principles, or hypotheses we use to make sense of things. Uh, another one is assumptions. These are beliefs we take for granted that usually operate at subconscious or unconscious levels of thought. Uh, with that uh, Native American history in the United States, like, I don't know how intentional it was by many authors uh, that were writing the history books that I read. Um, but, uh, you know, there was definitely, because there was a lack of awareness, uh, or maybe an assumption about what should be taught. It's like, oh, well, they only need to know this much about that, even though it's a huge part of our history and is that history is still being made today. Um, so assumptions are a good thing to keep in check. And then following what the implications and consequences are of, of that stream of logic. And I find this often when I was investigating security alerts, where I would have my hypothesis, I find some data that supports it, but I would, if this was true, there would be some implications or consequences that these things must be true if my assumption of finding this data. And then I went to look for that data and it wasn't there. So my assumption was not correct. And now I have to sort of figure out the model all over again, which is fun. And I like doing that stuff. And then we end, end up again at the point of view. So uh, this website's great. I think uh, doing an exercise, writing an article uh, just for yourself um, would be super useful with with some of these questions and digging in later. Didn't want to use all the time on that because there's lots of, oh, oh, secrets. Um, so next is model building. All that to say, all of these critical thinking questions are helping us build a model of, of how we think about the problem at hand. and. Really, the mo like the great thing is about models is every problem you have to solve, you are going to need a unique model. But every model that you've built in the past is going to be some and a model that you can adapt portions of into your new model. Like if you just bring the model in it directly, you may be you know missing some some inferences, assumptions, all those things when there's a new problem to be solved. So that changes the nature of the, the things you need to think about. But the cool thing is that uh, the more you build, uh, the better you'll get at doing it. And uh, I have a screenshot here from Dark Souls, or one of the Dark Souls. I'm not sure which one this is. But I think that's a really great video game in many ways. Uh, video games, often to get good at them, you are performing uh, pattern matching. But there is an element of model building there. Um, especially Dark Souls sort of introduces you to situations that are difficult and you kind of have to problem solve how I know this is what I need to do. How do I do it? Um, I think one of them starts with an area that has these skeleton, like a wide open space. And it kind of leads you that direction and you fight these skeletons that are way too difficult. But then you, you get tired of dying to the skeletons. It's the first area and you can't make it through that part. Then you start, well, what's over here? And then you start actually going the direction you're supposed to. But it's interesting that it makes you approach that problem. And then the, the answer is to give up and go somewhere else, which I thought was super cool. Um, another game or style of game that I think really uh, sort of brings about this idea of model building is uh, roguelites. Um, this is a new style of game. Uh, this, this screenshot is from one called Binding of Isaac. But something this, this does is that uh, for right there in that example, there are six items. The patterns of the enemies are going to be the same. The rooms, the general like play of the game is going to be the same. But these items often have things that work synergistically with each other. So giving the option of there's five items for, for Isaac to choose there. Good players have experienced the items enough times to know that like, oh, well, if I see this item, that probably works really well with this. And they find these interesting synergies and roguelites that they're 
their main feature is permadeath. Like, you, you try to go through the level, and then if you die, you have to start all the way at the beginning. So people who... Completing a roguelite is very difficult, because you have to model the whole game. You have to understand the enemy attack patterns. There's no save points. And you got to get good at utilizing the items that come to you. Some runs, you're going to get a lot farther than others, just based on the randomness of the items. But it does provoke that model building skill set that uh, we hope to to build up in ourselves. But time is it? Okay, I'm not going. I'm not doing too bad. Uh, so next, let's get into the attackers. I think this is the really juicy uh, bit that uh, people generally lean towards learning about attackers first. Um, something I stumbled upon the uh, the week before last um, that I thought was a really interesting uh, thing we could compare to. Uh, because I'm sure you've noticed that the news generally has more cybercrime buzzing about it, and uh, that's because it is happening a lot more. Um, but someone showed me these these equations, the predator-prey equations. There's a fancier name by the people's names who discovered it. But if you'll notice, this is, this is what a rabbit and a lynx uh, tracked populations. So as the rabbit population increases the lynx population shoots up. But then the rabbit population shoots way down and lynx don't have anything to hunt, so then the lynx start dropping. Then there's more rabbits and there's more lynxes. And it's, it just makes more sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense that, you know, when there's more prey, there's more predators. Uh, when there's less prey, the predators die off. And now, in the context of cybersecurity, there's lots and lots of prey. And there's only going to be more prey. Uh, that, that graph on the left is, uh, Internet of Things devices, which are notoriously insecure. Um, just, uh, manufacturers don't institute strong security policy, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. But that's just going to increase, especially as 5G comes into the picture, and there's really high, uh, you know, network throughput available to just things just sitting around. Um, and then we have a chart here of cybercrime damages. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it may not go exactly exponential, um, because, you know, we've got defense sort of butting up against it, but, um, the amount is going to increase. And the reason is there's more and more prey, more and more people are on the internet. Uh, there's more and more value that can be extracted through attacking on the internet. Um, so uh, that's just going to be a thing, and that means there will be lots of jobs to do this thing. So I'm happy you're here, and uh, soon, I'm sure you will have one if you uh, keep uh, grinding on it. So um, one of the coolest things, I think, even though it's cool in the sense that it's kind of terrifying, um, is, is a concept called Advanced Persistent Threats, or APTs. I think this was coined originally um, by this company FireEye, who I think is now called Mandiant. I'm pretty sure that's how the acquisition went. I'm not sure if it went the other way. Um, but they made a report, the APT1 report, about China. And they coined this term, the Advanced Persistent Threat. And if, I mean, if you break it down, advanced, they've got lots of resources, persistent, uh, they won't stop until they succeed and threat. Uh, they're, they're something that attacks vulnerable systems. Um, you should really read the APC1 report. It is fascinating. And because they have basically tied it down to a specific subsection of the People's Liberation Army. So APC1 is, is almost certainly the People's Liberation Army Unit 61398. And China, of course, will deny any cybercrime. Russia will deny. U.S. will deny. Uh, because there's always plausible deniability. You can really only approach, like, 99% uh, certainty. Because people can also be laying fakes. Like, China can be doing some espionage. And then put all of the, like, put Russian language keyboard settings and, and, and plant lots of Russia-esque stuff. So it looks like it's coming from Russia, perhaps. Or vice versa. Everyone does this stuff now. Regardless, there's no way to definitively prove. So we're almost certain APT1 is People's Liberation Army of Unit 61398, which they figured out by f like combing uh, job postings and then combing. They found aliases within uh, the malware that was 
identified with APT-1 because they attacked so many different sectors of the American economy. Um, and there was an alias of like a programmer name or like a hip, you know, a handle. And they traced those handles to people's social media profiles in China. And then those people got hired by the People's Liberation Army. And uh, the job postings were like, good English, uh, you know, and strong security skills and malware uh, creation, that sort of thing. So uh, as this, this whole thing is super fascinating. The cool part uh, is like there's different objectives um, by each nation state that usually performs these. China is super focused on economic espionage. So they, we are almost certain, uh, we spent $4 trillion developing, uh, the R and D for the F 35, the most expensive military object R and D ever. China almost certainly stole that design and then improved upon it with their engineers, uh, because, you know, they had more R&D cycles to spend when they've already got the, the pattern uh, built by um, America's uh, engineering workforce. Uh, so they focus a lot on economic espionage because they can pump up uh, businesses within China and uh, make more money that way. It's, it's kind of a really obvious, uh, especially the pattern. Uh, Mandiant has you know, observed APT-1, you know, it's the same malware and the same set of like tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, observed in all these different sectors. Um, and it's very difficult to replicate and make it look entirely like someone. Like you can drop some fishy things to like kind of lead off the scent, but when everything matches the same techniques, tactics, and procedures, then it's likely the same actor. Um, again, there's all critical thinking stuff, but, uh, we can be pretty certain. Uh, the next one I've got on the list is Russia. Uh, they've been doing uh, cyber espionage mostly to the Ukraine since the mid-2000s. Uh, but theirs is often much more geopolitical. Like China definitely does geopolitical cyber espionage, but Russia is way more focused on the geopolitical espionage, especially in the Ukraine. Obviously in the United States as well, um, you, but it's not like they, they create issues out of thin air. But if you've listened to interviews of, uh, God, uh, Putin's right-hand man, who sort of like is the propaganda man, and Putin was in the KGB, so he knows all about this stuff because the KGB and the CIA were really about messing with narrative, and they've done that for the past 40 years. Um, but he talks about, like, the idea is just to so... Un unknowns like they they support their fundamentalist christians and they support the gays but they'll often they'll extremize their support so you know uh, in the u.s election they they made very extreme far right memes and they made very extreme like moderate left memes so it's like very strong anti-hillary or like they would promote uh bernie sanders uh as the anti-Hillary, and if you vote for Hillary, you're bad. They're just, in any way that they can pull someone's lever and and get more discord in the United States, who is one of our geopolitical enemies still. Uh, enemies, I mean, whatever, they're just imaginary lines in the sand. But, um, yeah, they, they focus much more on this sort of geopolitical, psychological operations um, type stuff. So two of the APTs um, relatively well-known with them are AP28. I don't know why they got these bear-related names, but Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. Uh, how am I doing on time? Not too bad. Uh, and then last but not least, we cannot not mention the United States. <laughs> uh, they don't necessarily have a name. Uh, one person that... Uh, there's a group called the Shadow Brokers who found what is likely an arsenal of NSA tool sets and exploits. And they dubbed this group the Equation Group because of the very advanced cryptographic protocols and like obs uh, obfuscation uh, that was very cryptographically advanced uh, with, you know, unique algorithms not really seen elsewhere. So, uh, and, and what's we are 99% certain this is United States tools because the names match some of the tools in the Edward Snowden leaks. And uh, what's funny 
is that the United States, in this uh, group of tools uh, that the Shadow Brokers leaked, um, was a bunch of zero days. And zero days, what that zero day means, how long this thing has been fixed. So when a zero day is announced, that means, oh, everyone is just finding out about it, including the vendor that makes the product that has the vulnerability. Um, so the United States was sitting on like, I mean, I'm sure they've got more, but they were sitting on like four or five of American companies. They had back doors <laughs> into products made by American companies uh, that they just were not telling anyone about. Because the responsible thing to do that a lot of people who become red teamers or attackers and learn about InfoSec but do the attacking thing, they get rewarded with bug bounties. Um, where if they find a bug or an exploit or a vulnerability in a commercial product, they let them know, and usually they're rewarded with, like, lump sums. So, you know, some are, you know, as low as $1,000, but uh, I think Facebook has $100,000. Uh, you know, there's some big ones, so they just try and break stuff. And um, the responsible thing to do is let them know so they can fix it, because if someone has figured it out, someone else can also figure it out. So even if the United States thought they were the only ones with these four or five exploits, China could have it, Russia could have it, anyone else could have it, and they're exploiting companies with those zero days at the same time. So it's like a weird use of like an arsenal of weapons. And then uh, three months later, I think, because there was a very powerful exploit of the SMB protocol, which is a usually a file sharing protocol um, on networks, this... This uh, exp this zero day, even though there was a patch release shortly after the zero day, um, uh, this was utilized in a very popular ransomware campaign called WannaCry that almost shut down uh, the UK's hospital system because so many of them got hit by it. Um, but uh, yeah, they were, I mean, it's tough to institute patching. Like, even if a patch comes out, that means the amount of companies that actually get the patch applied to all of their systems, not always a high percentage. So, uh, yeah, the United States, the, I mean, the leak of the United States Zero Day um, for called Eternal Blue ended up with the WannaCry attack a few months later. Um, so the last thing I want to go over for attackers, and it kind of covers attackers and defenders, is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. This is kind of all the rage in security nowadays because it's sort of like, it makes it, uh, it groups together types of things that you can use to attack or things you need to defend in a nice little framework. So you can sort of figure out if you have defenses or you can try various versions of this attack. So I'm gonna go to their website real quick. Um, but I just wanted to show, we're going to look at the uh, attack, uh, mostly. Pre-attack, this is the stuff APT does. Uh, they're uh, selecting targets, gathering information on as many things as possible, looking for weaknesses. This is where they're es establishing infrastructure. Lots of the pre-work that happens before you actually attack a target. Um, you're researching people, figure out who to fish, how to fish them, like what, what pieces might make them click on something that gives you a foothold in the network. Um, so pre-attack is interesting, but we can't really do much about it as defenders. Uh, they just kind of do that stuff. And sometimes we can find some of the infrastructure and such, but, uh, we can't detect on this. This is kind of more, uh, mapping of techniques and tactics. So attack for enterprise. This is where we're, we're looking at detections. So you can sort of see... Uh, initial access. So these are often the steps in what used to, Lockheed Martin, I think, made something called the uh, cyber kill chain, which is like getting inside reconnaissance, lever increasing access, and then exfiltration. I think there were five steps, and those aren't them. I'm just guesstimating. But attack broke them out a little more, a little more defined each parts of those steps. So first they're getting, they're getting in, they're executing something bad. They're maintaining persistence in some way so that if, you know, antivirus catches it or something, they're still able to uh, reach their infected hosts. Privilege escalation, uh, they probably want to look for admin credentials, uh, maybe IT credentials. You know, even if an environment segments itself, there are ways to sort of like fandangle more and more credentials um, as once you're inside. Defense evasion, again, uh, trying to... it's. You know, some element of persistence, but it's more like making it invisible. 
Uh, credential access. This is kind of related to privilege escalation, but more like utilizing other credentials and uh, finding ways to harvest more credentials inside. Discovery uh, can be looking for things that might be valuable, uh, looking for accounts, that sort of thing. Lateral movement is now moving, like pivoting from one computer or server to another. Uh, collection is where they're collecting data to then exfiltrate. Command and control, I feel like, is a little bit earlier. I would throw it in here. I don't know why it's on the end. But uh, that's sort of how they maintain communications with, um, you know, their infected hosts inside. And then impact is, like, causing an impact to the business. Like, ransomware takes down a business. That is an impact. Um, but defacing the company website, whoever, whatever they want to do. Um, but I do want to briefly go into their website looking at the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So the cool thing about this is you've got all these tactics, but I can click on initial access, and then I get a bunch of techniques. So these are like the nitty-gritty of what that tactic implies. So uh, actually, I think I want to look at uh, execution, because these are very specific types of um, executing. So these are all different ways that have been observed in the wild of APTs utilizing one of these things to perform that tactic. Uh, so here's utilizing uh, DLLs um, that have vulnerabilities within them. Uh, here's utilizing the install util uh, executable. There are so many of these. I think there's uh, in the last version there was 270 something. Uh, now there's a newer version with more cloud techniques. But each one of these can click on, and down here we have the references of where where they built up this this detection from, or or this technique from. Excuse me. So it explains a little bit about the technique, um, how you might be able to mitigate the technique, and uh, we'll we'll go a little bit over in the defenders portion. Oh, I was hoping to see one that had aha procedure examples. So with this uh, Reg Server 32 technique, here's a list of various APTs, and you've got references to articles mentioning them utilizing this particular technique to attack um, somebody. But so you can read the articles of, you know, how they witnessed them utilizing that technique. Like, this is a really great... I mean, Talos Intelligence makes some great blogs. Um but they're talking about uh, how an attacker utilized this. But then you can see other attackers do it in different ways. So uh, yeah, the MITRE ATT&CK technique framework is brilliant, and uh, there's so much good information in there. Uh, the more you can learn about it, the better. I think there's a great uh, GitHub project called Atomic Red Team by the folks at Red Canary, where you can basically attack your infrastructure with little scripts that mimic one of those techniques. So you can find out if your detection infrastructure is able to catch this technique happening. And in this particular way that it attacks, there's always going to be ways to vary that technique and make it happen in a different way that your detection might not work. So all that to say, let's move into the defender part. Um, so really, there's not much to the slide. I go right back to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Uh, so on this page for MITRE ATT&CK, we had the mitigations and, and detections. Uh, so this is the part that I get to look at every day as I'm building alerts for these various things. A lot of times I still have to look at the articles of like witnessing the attack step by step to figure out even how to build the mitigation or detection that they talk about. Um, but the helpful thing is, is up here in the corner, they list the data sources you're going to need to um, detect or mitigate this threat. Um, so what a lot of... Um, you know, corporate enterprises do is, uh, where's the, oh god, what is it called? Attack framework. Uh, navigator, there it is. So, a company may take the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework, 
And then based off of what sources they have in their environment, do they have process monitoring? That's endpoint detection and response, which I will show you, I think, later this month when we do the Defender thing. Um, do we have Windows Registry monitoring? So if we have those data sources, maybe we could mark, mark it as, uh, where's the paint? We could mark it as yellow because we've got the data. We could, we could detect it if we had detections on our logs, but maybe once we build in some detections, then maybe we'll turn it green. Um, and then if there are some, you know, that we know we don't have data sources for these, let's make those red. Um, so then usually an enterprise can now look at their defense environment and be like, okay, we have these data sources, then they can prioritize. If we get these data sources, we can turn these reds to yellows. And then if we work on developing alerts, we can turn these yellows to greens. So it, it, it helps orient a, uh, an enterprise defense team to figure out where they're going to get the most bang for their buck um, in developing their defense. So I love my attack. Uh, last thing we're going to go over briefly, just because I think it's pretty cool, is the NICE, which is the National Institute for Cybersecurity Education, a cybersecurity workforce document. Uh, they've broken out basically seven different uh, categories of security jobs. Um, you can see securely provision, operate, maintain, protect, defend, investigate, collect, operate, analyze, and oversee and govern. Not only have they just made these groups, they have made an excellent document that if you know you are for certain interested in one of these parts of the circle, it will list the, the competence that you need to have. And uh, so let's look real briefly at this. Uh, I think this is... So this lists out more of the roles, uh, what the actual... Uh, job title would be, but uh, let's go back to this. So if you look for the NICE cybersecurity workforce framework on Google, you'll get to this page. I want you to look at the reference spreadsheet because this thing is super cool. Um, so when this loads, you've got all the categories. Um, they've got various colors. For then you've got a description of what these individual job categories would be. Here's the actual job names, a little more definition about that role. And then you've either got the tasks, which are what this role performs. So there is some overlap where two or three or 10 different jobs will have some tasks that overlap. Um, but this gives you an idea of what you're going to need to do this job. And maybe not all of them. And a lot of them are interrelated. But um, if you're curious about what you need to do to, to learn this, these are the tasks you're going to be doing every day in that type of job or some variation of the above. Um, they've got the tasks broken out. And then they also have the knowledge. I don't remember what KSA stands for. Uh, then you've got the knowledge of what you will need to perform that role. So these are the things you would need to perform all those tasks they listed in uh, the other, in the tasks section. So knowledge and skills. Um, there's a lot of overlap here. But this document can totally guide whatever you want to do. Uh, it lists here what you're going to need to know to do that job. It's a really excellent resource. And I, and I've, you know, when I talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, I often mention like, just do whatever sounds cool to you. Like whatever pulls you the most, do that because you'll get pulled and maybe you'll find some stuff along the way, or maybe you'll find you don't like it, but uh, at least it will pull you. And uh, you know, you'll, you'll be building competency in a space that is going to feed into any other space that you go to. So I highly recommend if you're trying to plan out your future of what you want to learn, this can help narrow down what you would need to learn to, uh, I mean, you're still going to have to Google for articles and training and all that sort of stuff to help you do those things. But uh, this is a great head start. 
All right, I think that that's all the slides. Just real quick. Uh, no, I'll do the link review at the end. It's quiz time. Uh, where is my window for the quiz? I'll just go there. All right, so get your devices ready. Um, the questions will be up here, and then the little, I think they're just colored symboled squares will be on your device. So you got to look at this screen and then answer on your device. You all know the drill at this point. All right, so you're going to go to kahoot.it and then enter in this pin. Yeah. And then we'll quickly go over the links afterwards at the end, and then you're free to go critically think about the world. Hi, Plops! Nagihama's back. Cool. Nice to see y'all. Hi, Amy. Aw, oh, yay! Mom's here. All right, we we'll see if we get any more peeps. We got some of the regulars here. And uh, we'll give another minute, maybe 30 seconds, uh, to get in here. I don't. I hope you don't have to critically think about whether you're going to join. You should just join. Yay, kazaa! Huzzah, kazaa! All right. Give a little bit more. See, there's 11 people in here, supposedly. Um, but uh, we got about half of everybody. I'm gonna start clicking that start button. If no one tells me no, I'm gonna click that start button. Okay, gonna click that start button. All right. So, first off, what are some critical thinking questions we can use to build a mental model? Hmm. Frame of reference? What information do I need? What am I assuming? Is this information accurate? Huh. I mean, those all... I mean... Hmm. Those are some good questions, I feel like. They seem pretty good to me. Yeah! All of those are excellent questions to uh, dig into something. I'm sorry this one doesn't have GIFs. I realize that took about an hour to add GIFs every quiz. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Which country is APT1 tied to? Three main, three main instigators I talked about in class, but there are a lot more. Um, just maybe not quite as advanced, or not quite as persistent, or not quite as a, a, a threat. <laughs> yep, yep. Ah, uh, Canada. <laughs> Those Canadian bastards. Yes, it's uh, the answer is China. That is APT1, and I highly recommend checking out the report. It's not too long. I think it's like 10 to 15 pages. But uh, how they break down, how they sort of sourced it to China, and uh, some of their techniques, it's really interesting. True or false? Once I find or learn a pattern, it's probably okay to use it exactly the same everywhere else. Exactly the same. This music's intense. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, there's going to be some problems like that, but especially in security, I think, uh, you know, every, every time you see it as a unique case, you do got to check, check all the corners. All right, Nagihama in the lead. Oh, it's a puzzle one. I think I have 60 seconds on these ones, because... In what order would an attacker perform a cybersecurity breach? I tried to make this, uh, some of the things we talked about, um, sort of narrowed it down to, oh, that last one over here is, God, 
exfiltration. I'm going to sit right here in the middle where it's safe. But uh, what would an attacker do first? And then what might they want to do? And then what are they going to do? And then how do they uh, put the icing on the cake? All right. Okay, I don't know. Does that mean 80% of you got it right? But yeah, the order is reconnaissance. Got to do that part first. Then they're establishing persistence. Uh, just in case they get kicked off before they could do anything. And then they're starting to collect things. And then lastly, they're exfiltrating data. Oh, it looks like Plops was the only one. Yeah, that was a toughie. The puzzles are always... But they make you tink. Uh, the United States does not have an APT group. We're not... We're not a threat. We're not. I mean, we're advanced. And we are very persistent. But not a threat. Not the United States. No. Yeah, we definitely have APT. Uh, it's called the a NSA. Um, all right. Papa took the lead with the points on that puzzle. And you get lots of points with this one, too. Which of these are APTs? Uh, Pink Flamingo? Fancy Bear? The Equation Group? And Lazy Walrus. I am so curious who comes up with the names for these. Yep, yep. Those are the main two. Equation Group and Fancy Bear. That's Russia and uh, the United States. 99% sure on both of those claims. All right, we're rolling into the final rounds here. A mental model I've built for critical thinking can only be used once for the problem I built it for. I guess based on how I talked today, I kind of... You could, you could throw this one either way, honestly. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's what I was hoping to get across, was that, uh, you know, sure, that exact model can only be used once for that problem, for that exact problem, but the more models you have, the more you're going to be able to draw upon to... Uh, to, uh, you know, make a better determination in the future. Multi-select, two times the points. Which of these are part of miter attack? We've got initial ac- Okay, my head's out of frame. Initial access, recon, execution, and establish infrastructure. So there's, there's miter pre-attack, and there's miter attack. The attack is the one we can actually detect. Or, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so the main two there are in attack. So there's pre-attack, which is uh, like the research they do beforehand um, that is very difficult to perform detections upon. But the miter attack framework is they are in your network or knocking on the door. Uh, and that's initial access, and then once they get in, they want to execute as quickly as possible. Hmm? Oh, nobody got them all right. Yeah, the pre-attack attack distinguish is, uh, a little too wonky. The amount of cybercrime and cyberterrorism is leveling out, and likely won't increase much further. Everything's gonna be okay, y'all. Um... Especially once you get those jobs, start making that money. Yeah, there's going to be lots more. I'm sure, you know, it's it's a cat and mouse game. Um, I didn't really mention this, but I do want to mention really briefly, is uh, on that sort of, like, evolution, like, there's something that evolution has done for a long time, but uh, 
like attackers will evolve their tactics and then defenders will evolve their defense to overcome it. And then attackers will make new attacks and then defenders make new, de new detections. And, uh, there was an article I read about, uh, sort of how IEDs in, uh, the Middle East, uh, against troop transports and such, like how their game changed as we developed more defenses but the difficult part uh, in building defenses is it's a lot more expensive for the United States to equip all of their vehicles with armored plating on the bottom uh, than it is for them to change the nature of their explosive device to defeat the armored plating. But that, that sort of attack and defense goes on in the cybercrime world as well. And uh, last question, which is the poll... Because I'm curious, what part are you most interested in? I sort of, like, combined a few different, uh, things here, but, uh, me, I'm a, uh, configuring and protecting, detecting, responding. Ah, man, I also like analysis. I don't know, it's hard to say. <gasps> okay, configuring and protecting. Interesting. Not as much interest in the detecting, responding. And then we got breakers. Someone always wants to break stuff. And analysis. I, I think that's really fun, too. All right. So I think in third, we've got Amy. Blah, 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 blah. And then Negehama. And then at the top of the board is our friend, Mr. Plops. <laughs> Yes, because uh, uh, I'm I'm happy you joined us. Look, you're a runner-up. You got on the board, technically. But, uh, yeah, sweet. Congrats, Plops. I I know you all have it in you, but this time Plops, Plops took the round. So, uh, just real briefly to end on uh, is the links for After Class, which, again, you can find at 7thDirection.com slash curriculum. Um... Portal 2D is pretty cool. I don't know if you played the game Portal, but it's an excellent game that definitely sort of embodies this, like, they don't give you exactly what the formula is, but they introduce, like, hey, you're able to do this. And then they present a problem uh, where you solve based on what you're able to do. But then they present a new problem, and the thing you were doing just before in the previous level that looks like it might work there doesn't because there's something you haven't figured out about a way you can use it you haven't figured out yet. The Portal game is genius for for this level of like problem-solving uh, ability increase and like forcing you to problem-solve to, to move forward. And someone made a 2D version of the game that's free, but you, utilizes the same premise and, and, and also has great level design where it sort of introduces you to concepts as you need to use them. I would highly recommend the original game as well as the Portal 2, which I'm, <laughs> I need to finish with Plops. <laughs> uh, but uh, this 2D version is great. Uh, and something I have gotten a lot out of um, a long time ago was uh, Poor Charlie, Charlie's Almanac. I, I read this summary recently just to get uh, another, um, just a sort of refresher on it without reading the book again. Uh, poor Charlie is, uh, just an investor, and because he has lots of money, also a philanthropist. Uh, but, uh, like, friend of Warren Buffett and such. Just a really smart investor. Very smart guy. Clearly very smart. And, uh, he, he expounds upon how important it is to have mental models. And because those mental models are often, like, when you've built up a model and understand where it can be used well... That is going to help you make better decisions. And he used it uh, for investment and as a business person. But uh, I think that summary uh, has a lot of nuggets of knowledge and, and wisdom in there from someone who has used a lot of various thinking concepts to uh, think themselves into a lot of wealth. Um, and then lastly, uh, something he mentions even is cognitive bias. And I think this is a great article that links to this image that is fascinating that links all of the cognitive biases, of which there are many. <laughs> um, but it's 
uh, and it sort of links them together based on like how difficult it is to look at lots of information, how naturally we pray, uh, fall prey to our own bias. Um, there's, I think, four major categories of cognitive bias, but that cheat sheet sort of breaks them out and includes an image breaking down the the one by one sort of uh, appeals of things that sound logical. Uh, and may appeal to some sense of logic, but actually if you look at them with critical thinking and you take them apart with, uh, you know, the cognitive bias you know the word for, uh, then, uh, yeah, it can help you think a lot better and more clearly and more accurately. So, uh, that is the class for today. I just barely brought it in at 6 p.m. Um, thank you all for hanging out. Um, I do have it equipped, um, do have my setup equipped to now accept guests in Discord. Um, so we could, I, I've wanted to like shorten the lecture and get to aim for more 45 minutes and then have like a 15 minute sort of like bring a student on like Q and A back and forth, um, because I think that would be really helpful. So maybe let's plan, I'll, I'll plan to purposely have some Q&A, definitely. I'm going to cut the lecture short, I swear. I know it's very hard for me because I'm a good rambler. But um, yeah, next class, let's, uh, if, if you want to chat and have a Q&A that you don't mind being recorded, that would be awesome. And again, I am always free. Feel free to reach out to me, Discord, email, whatever. And uh, yeah, we would... Uh, we can talk off the air about uh, where you're at and where you want to go. So cool. Thanks y'all for joining. I go and click that bye bye button. Oh, first I'll do this. Oh, wait. I wanted to do this first. And then I'm going to say, all right, bye everybody. Thanks for coming. See you soon. Bye bye.